make no small plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood. Those are the words of Daniel Burnham, a renowned architect in the late 1800s. For him, it was the right time at the right place to think big. At Tryon Palace, there has been a long history of dreamers who dared to think big, even from its inception. In 1764, William Tryon, who was soon to be governor of North Carolina, selected the perfect spot at the confluence of the Neuse and Trent Rivers for the colony's first official government house. Working with English architect John Hawkes, they designed and built a governor's mansion and capital that was regarded as the finest public building in the American colonies. In February of 1798, fire ravaged the main building. Later, the kitchen office was demolished, leaving only the stables standing. As time went on, George Street was extended over the original palace foundations, leading to a bridge that crossed the Trent River. Dozens of houses and businesses were built on either side. And I looked in my history book, and I saw this gorgeous picture of Tron Palace. So I ran from Central School, I was in the seventh grade. I ran down to George Street looking for the Tryon Palace. And I asked everybody, where's the Tryon Palace? Where's oh, you mean that old apartment house down there? I said, is that the Tryon Palace? That's what's left of it. In the 1930s, a movement began to restore North Carolina's first capital in the face of a nearly insurmountable task, requiring the relocation of a neighborhood, moving a major highway and bridge, ultimately convincing two North Carolina governors and changing the minds of the town council. Move a U.S. Highway 70, have another bridge constructed, and buy up all these plots of land. It took an act of Congress this was further complicated by the need to locate the original plans and excavate the foundation of the mansion built over 160 years earlier. As that construction was going on in the 50, early 50s, and my job from time to time was to beat the plaster off of this building that is right behind me, which was the stable wing, which was the only part of the original palace that had survived. While there were many who contributed to the reconstruction that was completed in 1959, there were several women who shared a vision and played key roles in making it possible. In 1929, Mrs. Kate B. Reynolds of Winston-Salem provided the first cash gift toward the restoration of the palace. Mrs. Reynolds did give the original very generous gift, uh, a gift that may not sound like a huge amount in today's dollars, but in the dollars of the time was. And the Reynolds family does have a history of contributing greatly to this state. Mrs. Minette Chapman Duffy a leader in the New Bern Historical Society was able to rally support both politically and socially for the effort. Nett Duffy was not a native New Bernian. She was from Tennessee, but she was married to a prominent doctor. Uh, there were several Dr. Duffys and she was married to one of them. Like most people, she saw it from the outside and came in and saw the potential, what other people had lived with and just did not see it. Miss Gertrude Carraway was instrumental in numerous ways, working towards political support, locating the original plans, and implementing a strategic plan for the process. Miss Gertrude Carraway went to the Sir Walter Cabinet meeting, and it was very, very important to the building of the palace, or the rebuilding of the palace. She directed those spouses to go home and have some very good pillow talk with their husbands and get that palace built because it was the women that were going to make a difference. In 1944, 
Mrs. Maud Moore Latham established a significant trust for the purpose of starting a restoration fund for Tryon Palace. It began with Maud Moore Latham through her bequest and then her daughter and her husband that were the big impetus to get the original Tryon Palace started. Additionally, she began collecting antique furniture, mirrors, chandeliers, silver, china, and paintings to go into the restored palace. And so each time you go through the palace, there's a wonderful story behind every piece in there. You look at every piece and you study it. Her daughter talked about Mrs. Latham's vision during this Greensboro television interview in 1959. Well, at that particular time, there was a wave of enthusiasm for restoration all over the state, I would say. Great many people were interested and they were particularly interested in Tryon Palace. They moved Highway 70. I mean, just think about that. A major North Carolina U.S. highway. So the vision of these four women, Mrs. Reynolds, Mrs. Duffy, Miss Carraway, and Mrs. Latham, who proposed plans cited by a National Park Service official as being impossible, impractical, and undesirable, succeeded, not only in the restoration of the palace, but also created a lasting legacy for all North Carolinians. Our goal early on, I think, as a family was to recognize North Carolina's history and its importance to colonial history um, and have more people know that. I mean, this is a very important place and one that's worthy of being preserved. A legacy that has touched the lives of well over a million school children who have visited since the reconstructed palace opened in 1959 standing at the gates when Luther Hodges, Governor Luther Hodges, uh, cut the ribbon. It was a great day, really. And the Kellenbergers were so wonderful that day. They were Miss Gertrude Carraway. She was the greatest spirit of the palace all those years. Tryon Palace has had a reputation of more than 50 years of providing great history entertainment to adults and children plus millions of additional visitors from all over the world during the past 50 plus years. In 1995, shipbuilder Barber Boatworks went out of business. They were a, a very important part of the Newburn waterfront and Newburn economy. And I'm glad that Tryon Palace has honored that heritage. The vacated property adjacent to Palace Square provided a new opportunity for Tryon Palace as it looked for ways to further its mission of education for a new generation. People organizing was the turning point. We had to have the property before it could get started and it just took lots of private dollars from uh, individuals, from corporations, from the state, from the county. The acquisition of the property for the History Center was a catalyst in this $60 million project. Nothing at Trine Palace has been done in a small way. Uh, when I told you that my grandmother was involved, uh, this was a road at that point in time and, and uh, no palace. When we began a $60 million campaign to build a history center, uh, it was just as monumental a task. The 60,000 square foot North Carolina History Center was designed by using up-to-the-minute technology with the goal of making history an adventure to the past. History is not static, and so the methods used to teach it should not be static either. So we set about on a quest to decide how to put the visitor in, in control of the experience. Minds On exhibits that transport visitors back in time to sail a ship make a quilt, or print a newspaper are some of the many environments being used to reach and teach a new generation of young visitors. You're a part of the past. You become immersed in it, literally immersed in it. And they'll be able to see and understand and think and feel like a character would a hundred years ago or two or three hundred years ago. Multimedia displays dramas, and multiple galleries immerse visitors, young and old, in an experience environment. So people walk into an exciting present day structure with present day communications, and then from there they can go back in time. Of course capped off by a tour of the palace itself.
So what is the legacy of dreamers? Like the projects that came before, it took dreamers who dared to think big and visionaries who would share their excitement with others to accomplish a goal larger than they could achieve alone. Starting with Governor Tryon's dream to construct one of the finest public buildings in the American colonies, followed by the daring women of the 1930s who led to its reconstruction, the new North Carolina History Center at Tryon Palace is indeed a monument to their efforts and a lasting legacy for generations to come. You may be asking yourself, what can I do? Well, there are many ways to become part of the legacy at Tryon Palace. Achieving such large tasks requires the efforts of many, including people like you, contributing to preserve the history and rich heritage of North Carolina. It takes those who volunteer and give of themselves. The real key is can you make a difference? And at uh, on our board and with our members, we really do make a big difference at the Tryon Palace, and that's the, the exciting part. It also takes the multitudes of children who both give and receive, starting a new phase of dreamers and doers.